You are listening to the War on the Rocks podcast on strategy, defense, and foreign affairs. My name is Ryan Evans. I'm the founder of War on the Rocks. In this episode, I spoke with General Gary Brito, the commander of U.S. Army Training and Doctrine Command. I got to know him a little bit better, and we spoke about strengthening the Army profession, one of the key initiatives of General Randy George, the Chief of Staff of the Army. General Brito also has an article coming out on the subject with us in War on the Rocks in about a week, so don't miss that. Enjoy the show. General Brito, you command Training and Doctrine Command. What, what is that exactly? U.S. Army Training and Doctrine Command. It so happens this is our 50th anniversary. And to kind of simplify it, I, we have the responsibility for training the very best soldiers in the Army, leadership development for the Army, helping shape the future force, welcome working with our other commands as well. And the connective tissue is helping build Army culture also. So in my words, that first layer of bricks to contribute to the war fighting readiness of the Army starts here. Not to say that we own it, but training the very best soldiers, developing the very best leaders to include our civilian professionals, helping shape the future force, working with future command, futures command and others, and building a very positive Army culture is very important. And I would say that we have a very big interest in a role in supporting are recruiting and accessions for our Army as well, because once they're in, they have to get trained. So we have a hand-in-hand relationship with a recruiting command and really supporting our Army. I think a lot of people don't appreciate, maybe even in the Army, how sprawling and large TRADOC is and all the different things that it's responsible for. Could you talk a bit about that? Sure. I will tell you, in, in numbers, it's not the largest four-star command, but it is spread across the nation, and even then some with the regional training institutes. So to include the centers of excellence, which run things to the ones at Fort Leavenworth, we have 10 of them everywhere from southwest to the Cyber Center of Excellence in Fort Eisenhower, Georgia, as far west as Fort Huachuca Intel Center of Excellence and Oversight of Defense Language Institute in Monterey, California. So all these centers of excellence from coast to coast, a partnership with an Army, uh, the National Guard and Reserves as well, working with our regional training institutes, and we have some satellite local organizations overseas that work with our foreign partners as well. Have a very close relationship with counterpart organizations. As an example, I saw my German counterpart who runs their version of Trade Up just a couple of weeks ago to include relationships with some other countries. And we have their liaisons resident in the in the headquarters. So a big command, about 50,000 uh, uniformed, about 14,000 civilian professionals. And I bring those two up on purpose because we cannot work without each other, 100% rely on the expertise of our civilian professionals working in harmony with our, our green suitors across all the centers of excellence. And of course, the headquarters itself at Fort Eustis, Virginia, with the rest of the command coast to coast, which does require a lot of travel, but necessary. And professional military education as well in the Army? PME, uh, professional military education, I tie that to the training of our soldiers in leader development, largely run through what I call our Deputy Commanding General for Combined Arms, uh, CAC at Fort Leavenworth. But, of course, a a nesting with all the centers of excellence, which run their levels of proponency, uh, the maneuver, fires, and others. TRADOC has a kind of a storied history. It came out of perceived failures to understand what was going on and how the Army should learn uh, sort of in the later Cold War period. Could you talk a bit about that? Sure. And I actually did do some study on that to, one, understand the purpose of the command and what brought it to be at this point. Uh, as I mentioned in the, in the uh, opening remarks, 50-year anniversary this year, July 1st of 73. Also, for 50 years, uh, the All-Volunteer Force and Forces Command uh, stood up. And looking at the work that General Starry and Dupuis and others did back then at the post, the tail end of Vietnam, not to highlight the big five, but we saw a necessity not only for equipment, but leadership development and hardcore standards-based training, to put it in simple terms. And that has been the driving force of what training and doctrine command does for our, for our Army. Obviously, working very closely with now with Forces Command and the five-year-old Army Futures Command. It's necessary that we nest together in the training, leader development, all the integration, not to get too geeky on you, but the Dotland PF, Doctrine, Training, and Leadership Development, the whole piece. And you can see how that must require some integration from this command through the Centers of Excellence, Army staff. Uh, the other ACOMs as well, to deliver a full package combat readiness warfighting capabilities for the Army. So I would say, to simplify it, uh, the training leader development, uh, the nesting of all the Dotland PF, 
integration to support warfighting is what this command does for the Army in synchronization with the other commands and supporting the ASCCs, USAPAC, uh, USERO, and others as well. To go back to the beginning of your career, why did you decide to join the Army? This may surprise you a bit, but I joined Army, Army ROTC as an extracurricular activity. I went to Penn State University. I started off as a, at a branch campus and saw an information booth that sparked my interest. So I called a primal queue in Army ROTC. I uh, just so decided to try it. I liked the leadership challenges. I liked what the Ranger Club offered at that time. Do you and remember so, what the booth looked like or what it said? I, I, I don't remember what it said, but I do remember it was a simple flat card table with mm-hmm. some brochures and, hey, join Army ROTC. Army, Army ROTC. And it was a guy, this is a true story, bad dad joke, but I named Captain Payne, who was the PMS. <laughs> and he, he gave me the, the, the brochure. The bad dad joke is he made major not too long ago, had some major pain later on in life. True story. <laughs> I was a non-scholarship cadet, actually. I couldn't get my grades together in the very beginning. At the latter years, I did. And decided I was going to do four years and get out. But that four years turned to what it is now simply because I really, really do like what I do. I've always liked what I do. Promised my then girlfriend that I was going to do four years. She's still my wife. And, and it's been a great journey going on 37 years now. And tell what was your career field? And is that what made you fall in love with the Army or was it just? Well, I, I, I wanted to be an architect initially, but this math and some other things caught me. I changed my major to community studies, urban planning type stuff, which I really did enjoy. But within ROTC was was, was the people. And, and I don't say that, to say that to be a corny bumper sticker, but it was really the people uh, in, inspiring others to, to be all they can be, helping myself, I guess, be all I can be, and give those opportunities to others. So I very much uh, enjoyed that as what's been the inspiration since. Now, it is not always fun, has not always been fun, but for the most part, it has been. And, and that's what probably kept me going all along. If I could pick one thing, Ryan, I could probably talk all day about it. But when you see a young soldier who a few years down the line, you see he's where he or she's wearing E7 stripes, even a sergeant major, which I've seen, or, or an officer that you might have commissioned an officer candidate school who makes the rank of general, you know, you can't get anything more satisfying uh, to see there's some seed that you might have had a had a, well, some play with, grew into something. Uh, and, and that's what it's all about. Who were some of the best bosses that you had in the Army before you became a general officer? Well, that's, that's a tough one. I, I'd probably have to grab a pen and pad and think about that a little bit. I, you know, I'm going to put a little twist in it. I won't say a best boss, but a best leader. And it was a platoon sergeant. Uh, my very first one, well, second one, is a skull platoon leader sergeant, first class, now retired, uh, Pete Adams who I still keep in touch with. He actually came to my four-star promotion. Uh, so he truly saw from second lieutenant to four-star, and we keep in touch. And really epitomized uh, the embodiment of a leader, selfless servant, and a non-commissioned officer. A little bit old school, too, because he was a Vietnam vet and still has biceps bigger than mine, but he was really a good leader. And a variety of battalion commanders. You know, one was a general. Of, I, I worked for, for several over the years that just, just inspired me, and, and he learned a lot from I, I won't name all their names, but just a variety of positions. And then you have some that weren't the best that you learn from as well. And and that's part of leader development. And I would say, even before it became more formalized, of the importance of mentorship. And sometimes it's just a walk in the desert. Hey, do you think about this? Or this is how you should run this range or, or what have you. So I saw the value early on. I felt very, to this day, feel fortunate to have learned the importance of a leader at any echelon, whether it's a company commander, a first sergeant, battalion commander, taking a few minutes to invest in a person's development or just invest in listening to him or her, a level of empathy. And that's the full circle portion of leadership, which to this day and, and excites me and fires me up. And even being more connected to trade off because we do that. You know, leadership development. We develop soldiers. We develop. We train soldiers. We develop leaders at all levels. The importance of counseling, mentorship, and it it just breeds into the investment of the people. I'm giving you a long answer here, but it be, it breeds into the investment of our people, so that we'll tr- truly be able to get everything we can out of our modernization, and other efforts that just make our make our army better. Uh, so that asymmetric advantage that our army has is is our folks. Our people from all walks of life and the investment we put in their training and leadership development 
You know, non-commissioned officer corps, I would say better than any army in the world. But at the end of the day, with all the innovation we have, all the technology we have, the investment we put in training those soldiers to be brilliant at the basics, and I'm borrowing the Sergeant Major of the Army's term, leaders that can think, agile, understand their trade as well, that's our advantage. And that'll always keep us ahead of where we need to be with our adversaries. One of uh, General George, the Army Chief of Staffs, who we, we did a podcast with him recently that listeners might have heard, one of his big pillars for his time as, as running uh, as, as service chief is, is Army professionalism. And as trade commander, you're really the lead on this. Could you talk about, uh, obviously, Army professionalism isn't a new thing, but I think the, the way it's being emphasized and the specific vision here has some exciting and new aspects to it. But I think it's also something that it's hard for people to wrap their heads around because it's a term that means so much. Yes. And so yes. Hmm. what is uh, your intent for how you're approaching this, how you're changing things? What is what is what parts of Army professionalism do you intend to focus on? Ryan, one, thanks for your support. And I, I'm, I'm very excited right now, given the focus areas that our chief and our secretary has given us, and very fired up about having ownership of the Army profession as, a, as an underpinning of all. And my, my staff has seen it when we, when we do the pre-command course and other courses, purposely have this graphic of bricks. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first layer of bricks with the readiness that our Army needs starts here to underscore the importance of what our commanders and leaders in the command must do. And the Army profession is a big part of that. You know, what it really means behind what, what, what you said when you raised your hand and took the oath, the importance of is ensuring when you leave whatever school, you're brilliant at what your basic basic blocking and tackling, my words. You're a leader of a character who can make decisions and think and act and knows his or her skill set. The importance behind that first layer of bricks when it comes to combat readiness or war, war fighting readiness came from some observations in this case at one of the training centers. I've had the good fortune of being stationed at both of them, both in the United States, National Training Center, Fort Irwin, and the Joint Readiness Training Center, now Fort Johnson. And you see good, you see bad. But I did see on a couple occasions junior leaders or junior soldiers who were not comfortable in what they were supposed to be doing. And you saw some good stuff as well, clearly. But it was it was the first observation of not being comfortable in your respective skill set. It was a light bulb moment. If I ever had an opportunity again in life to ensure that what is delivered to the Army is comfortable and competent, tied to our doctrine and their basic skill set, I was going to ensure that it was done. So a, a rifle platoon leader coming out of I. Bullock is ready to be a rifle platoon leader. Same with a private coming out of the 11 whatever school at any, any echelon. And this carried over to an opportunity at Fort Benning, then Fort Benning, Georgia, and definitely has some merit in this command where you're going to be bringing it to basics. You're going to be a well-developed leader from observations seen before. There's no compromise. And we owe that we owe that to the soldiers that are going to deploy, period. It underscores what the Army is about. And I think it's deliberate. I may be taking some risk in saying this, that of the four focus areas the chief assigned to the ACOMs, warfighting, continuous transformation, delivering combat ready forces, and strengthening the Army profession, it's deliberately listed last as underpinning all above it. And not to say that the others won't be successful without. So competence, commitment, and character. Our doctrine uh, states that. And if you look at it from just a simple execution uh, lens, and I, I, as a, I, speaking for the command, take this seriously in building the commitment to the Army profession, uh, the level of competence you need in your respective skill, and the character that we need as U.S. Army soldiers, all ranks, and civilian professionals as well. And if you use those as an azimuth or a beacon to drive what we do as a command for the Army, it underscores the importance of our, our, the Army profession, continuing to strengthen the profession, and investing in the profession as an institution, the Army, and all the programs that support it, and the professional, professional the soldier, and what we give him or her. Not only is that in our doctrine as well, and if it's not, I'm going to get it updated to ensure that it is. Now, here's, here's why I think that's, in, I would offer, Ryan, that it's important for a focus for the command is for us to invest both intellectually, could be financially, what have you, in, in what we do to 
once those future soldiers are assessed into the military, to ensure we give them the very best training at their respective level. I'll explain that in a moment in the continual learning. The same on the investment with our leaders. So as they go up their ranks, when it comes to being assessed or, or selected for command, they're ready for it. And it could be to general officer level as well. So let me back up a tad bit. And I say the continuum of learning. And this is a, getting a little bumper sticky geeky a, a tad bit, but it, it fully within the, in the rucksack or the mission of the command to enable pr the profession and professionals for the United States Army. So the training that a private will get in basic training in AIT, that continuum of learning ensures that he or she gets the same level at a different echelon when they come back as a sergeant, when they come back as a sergeant first class. You can apply the same for the lieutenant when he or she comes back as a captain, major, and so on. So that continual continuum of learning and the professional development of that soldier or leader should continue throughout their career. And in doing that, also help develop leaders that have a prevention mindset. Help develop leaders in so mindset. Well, that will not tolerate harmful behaviors or puts the investment in a positive command climate or has the character traits that we we as a as a military need for them to have the privilege of leading America's uh, young men and women in the army. Uh, I'll take risk in offering these are my words and I'll own it. A soldier and a leader is going to join the military with whatever they got on their kitchen table from their culture from the church or they did not. So in joining uh, the military, it's important at the right uh, the army at the right point to invest in a person of a character, integrity, one who understands values, or what's really behind the oath that, that they've taken, whether it's an officer oath for commissioning or enlisted oath. So what's really behind that? And, and, and again, in my turn, what's behind the U.S. Army name tape and that flag that's on your shoulder? Because the Army could de will deploy, just like any of the, any of the service. So that character, commitment, and competence is key. Character, commitment, competence, and I would add characters and, and culture is a big part of it as well. So it sounds like, from what I gather, this is about increasing our the Army's expectations for the sorts of training and education it provides and what it expects out of the soldier and leader. Is that fair? Well, that, that's fair. And there's another full circle part of that as well. We have to maintain a trust with America. So if you have a culture of values-based military, that's Army, that's professional, our soldiers indeed act in, in that respect, and they should, in, in a very genuine fashion. And also have the war fighting skills and competences that he or she may need to deploy, fight, and win, because that's why the Army exists. That full circle relationship with, one, the moms and dads that allow the soldiers to join, uh, support the soldiers to join, or leaders as well. And the, and the trust and handshake that we must have with, with America also is key. And it comes with, with being looked at in deed and actions as a professional Army made up of professionals, soldiers, leaders, civilian professionals. And I'm not going to say that it's broken by far. There may be some things that are bent a little bit that we just need to continue to focus on. And even more so, our Army always goes through, uh, not always, but has a level of transformation, whether it's shifting from counterinsurgency operations to large-scale operations, being ready to, to defeat multi-domain operations, multi-domain threats. We'll go through a level of transformation, but with that, we will always continue to ensure that our Army is professional as an organization, programs that support our troops as well, made up of well-trained, disciplined professionals. So what will this mean in practice? I know you're still, you know, General George is, has only been chief, what, for about six months yeah. now? Yeah, And mm -hmm. I know some of this is still coming together, but how, how long have you been trade out commander? I'm going on 16 months uh, this month, as a matter of fact. And, so yeah. you might be a, about at the halfway point or, or less. It's, uh, it's unpredictable uh, with general yeah, officers. Well, I would say give or yeah. take, a, probably give a few, almost closing in on the halfway point. So in execution, I definitely, and, and it's not about my watch, but during my watch, my successor's watch will continue to focus on this because it's, it's literally that important. And it's not starting from ground zero. It's, it's relooking how we, what we have done well and then having the humility to see if there's a gap that needs to be reworked, rework it. And it, that could be something as simple as how do we deliver basic combat training, or how do we incorporate foundational and life skills to our new soldiers in the beginning? But when do you start talking about the importance of Army culture? I'm giving just a couple examples. 
that we've taken the opportunity with the secretaries and the chief's guidance to do a, a dry erase board approach and just look at what we're doing and continue to do well what we do well as, as a command down at the centers of excellence or down to the proponencies and also realize that gap could be creating a lack of trust with XYZ or that gap could be creating a lack of proficiency in the following skills or how do you address it. And just to, to truly embody what, what it means to be a professional soldier. You know, a big part of professionalism, and I know you and General George are very supportive of what the Harding Project, sort of revitalizing yeah. the Army's professional journals, but also inculcating a, uh, a culture of public communication, debate, yes. writing mm -hmm. among mm -hmm. soldiers. And, you know, it goes back to how we originally met several years ago when I was teaching a class for new Army Two Stars on writing for outside DOD audiences. So what are the feedback mechanisms? It sounds like a lot of the specific initiatives are still being put together for professionalism. What are the ideas you'd like to hear from soldiers on this? And where would you like to hear them? How would you like them to communicate these ideas? No, thanks, Ryan. I'm really excited about this. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add, add some, some context and some, some of it's personal. Uh, but I'm really excited about anything we can do to generate professional discourse that is free. And I'll use the words, my, my words, free opportunity to just discuss things, free opportunity to share lessons that I, I, a person might have observed, free opportunity to share with TTPs, uh, techniques, procedures, and something that uh, a light bulb moment that I personally had in looking at better ways to generate professional discourse is connect to the majority of the Army, which might be below the age of 40. Uh, the young soldiers and leaders that are out there that, one, have ideas, two, experiences, and things they could just help in the, in the professional dialogue and di uh, di discourse at, at any level. And I say free because I'm not grading your report. You're not doing a thesis in the war college. You could be, but it could just be generated through the specific branch journal or the green book or, or military review just to help people think of some things. Uh, so if I may continue to, to drag on with this, but in that, we also looked at, as a command, what avenues might have been lacking. So I, I can say there's, there's been some, some momentum in our professional branch journals that existed more heavily when I was a lieutenant and a captain and a major than they do now. And part of that is, is one, do young soldiers look at the glossies as much as they did back then than they do now? No. So what can we do better as a command to help our Army connect to some of the, uh, the innovative social media venues that may be out there? I'm aging myself. I couldn't name them all right now, not only YouTube and other things, but there's some, certainly some, some platforms that are more accessible very quickly, uh, iPhone accessible, hopefully, that would resonate more with the younger, the younger generation, but a bigger generation than it might have 15, 20 years ago. Would you be willing to assure especially our Army listeners, our soldiers out there, also, but also the Department of the Army, mm -hmm. civilians and contractors that support the Army. If, they're, if they write or podcast or whatever it is, something substantive about how to improve Army professionalism, that it'll get read by your staff? Ryan, yes, I would uh, be willing to, to own it and, and listen to what people offer to strengthen our Army profession or anything. It could be how they did at this NTC rotation. And we need to do that. Look at it this way. This is the full circle professional discourse. And that, that's very helpful. And you might read something you disagree with, but you might read something, gee, Captain, that was great. Or, gee, Sergeant, that was great. I was uh, I do a lot of bat battlefield circulation, just visiting TRADOC units and others, and was visiting a course at Fort Bliss, uh, our, our NCO Academy, and challenged a sergeant to write about this course that you're going through now. It happened to be on battle staff management. What do you think about it? Just, just to bring the audience in, because it's, it's building to our profession. So yes, we would, and I need to also ensure that we have repositories in the venues for you to click and 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 input things and make it go quickly as well. So I, I was very, very excited about this opportunity. I think it's important. What's your timeline target for when you'd like to be ready to start rolling out announce, announcing some of the major initiatives under professionalism? 
Uh, well, we've started doing some of that already at, at all levels of Echelon, informally, uh, through the commands and others. There's some big things that I uh, we, we do have plans to sync to the upcoming AUSA, which would be in a couple, well, nine months from now, but it'll, it'll come very quickly. And not waiting on, on big forms like that. I can do it, and we are, at, 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 through emails, uh, through publications, through faster doctoring that we're doing, and just updating our command. So. I, I would say that the targets are now, and I don't need to wait uh, when we have a good idea or something that's working. We just get it done. Just make it happen. TRADOC, even after the creation of Futures Command, is still such an essential part of the Army about learning about what's happening and what the Army needs to become to be ready for the world as it's evolving. And obviously, one of those conflicts that everyone's been watching very closely for two years now, we're at the second anniversary of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. How is TRADOC approaching learning from Ukraine, thinking about Ukraine, and, and what it means for the Army in the future? Ryan, consistent dialogue and communications with one SAG, you, and the leadership that's over there. Uh, I personally, through TRADOC, or I say personally, through the command, we've actually sent a, a team from our Combined Arms Center, Center of Army Lessons Learned, over there as well, and have a person over to, to Ukraine, to, to, to Eastern Europe, okay. uh, to, to work with the advisory group that's in in Germany right now, and also have a a person physically in Eastern Europe as well with the Seventh ATC Command to capture the lessons that come through. What's most important here is it just doesn't go in a green book and on a shelf. Is identify where those true lessons that have been there's a distinction between observed and lessons really learned. And applying that as quickly as we can uh, to how we train our U.S. forces to one, understand whatever threat may be used, or or better yet, act against it. So how does it feed into leadership development? How does it impact, if, if at all, our future or current doctrine, training plans, CTC rotations? So that's the importance of truly learning a lesson and applying it to what the command does across all adult PF. Uh, Ryan, if I may, and, and you mentioned Army Futures Command, uh, I, I think this is the fifth anniversary. Hand in hand, great partnership with Army Futures Command. We must, and specifically in the lessons learned, I reached out to my battle buddy, Jim Rainey, and, and hey, we want to go look at, or we're hearing, we're hearing uh, just for illustration, we're hearing this about the use of fires right now. So what can we do to partner together, go learn about this and bring it back into Dotland PF integration, whether it's future concepts or current first force development, or, hey, we didn't expect uh, the, the use of UAS in this way. How do we spin to, to beat that threat today? So I'm very happy with the synergy between all the commands to, to bring those back. It's just not one single thing out of Fort Leavenworth. I'm sure that TRADOC sponsors a number of war games. How has the role of wargaming changed, not just at TRADOC, but over the time that you've been a more senior officer, because there's been, ever since I believe it was 2015 under General Selva and, and Bob Work, who's then Deputy Secretary of Defense, there's been this huge investment in the department in wargaming. And how have you observed games improve, change, expand over time? Yes, uh, that's a very tough, tough question. But one, like understanding where our technology has advanced. And, and when, I, when I say that, we have new ways to train and do things and simulate things as well. But what I've seen, Ryan, if I, I can offer one thing in my experience in the short time, 16 months in TRADOC, or just over the last seven years, is this command and others working with the warfighting exercises, working with a, a specific exercise that may be taking place in Indo-PACOM or what have you, just for illustration, to tie it to TRADOC. And I'll, 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 I'll by name, well, not by name, but by position, our TRADOC G2, uh, to fully understand the adversaries. And in some aspects, role-playing the red team aspect of those adversaries. And just most recently supported an exercise with Endopaycom. And I understand this specific threat. And it allowed us to build the command, to build the muscle they needed through the wargaming exercise, uh, through a warfighting exercise, or some level of training event. So the synergy between the commands, Army staff, and sometimes pulling in uh, civilian expertise as well. I've seen that that evolution in the wargaming uh, wargaming lane. What's a book that you're reading right now? You know, interestingly enough, because I'm a more senior person right now, <laughs> this one happens to be non-military, and it's called the uh, 
title Younger Next Year. It was actually a former retired general who recommended this on LinkedIn. It, it talks about building resiliency and strength that you need to stay healthy, I would say, above 55 when you become AARP eligible. Some really good stuff in there. Not only mentally, but physically, some things to pay attention to. There's a couple of others that are really quick, quick reads, and I've always had a passion for leadership. And uh, Harvard Business Review does some very small, quick read pamphlets on, on authentic leadership, genuine leadership, emotional intelligence, and they're real quick reads. And I, I get those freak frequently, no more than half an inch thick, just to kind of stay attuned uh, to the aspects of, of serving leadership. And lastly, one I just finished over Christmas, and my son's bought it as a Christmas gift, actually, called Hidden Heroism. And it talks about, in this case, it was uh, African-American generals in, in the United States Army um, and invisible generals by Doug Melville. And it specifically talks about some relatives of his, David, General Davis Sr. and Jr. And it's also a very quick read. And I had the opportunity to meet him, the author, at a function I went to at West Point about two years ago. Such a big part of professionalism seems to be this learning that you do as you're living your normal life and, and doing your normal job. But it can be hard to fit these things in. So it's, you know, when you, your, your hours, I'm sure, and saying I've never met a general officer that didn't work some just unreasonable amount of hours. How do you find the time to fit these learning experiences into your, into your day? Ryan, definitely a challenge. And I will admit I've not done well at it, getting better at it. And I uh, had the humility to listen to somebody who gave me some techniques. Hey, Gary, you can keep it in your backpack and read it while you're on the subway ride or wh while you're on the middle air flight going between point A and B. So really capturing, and in, in, in literally to help manage this capturing in 15 to 30 minutes, just to drop everything you're doing for a moment or two and finish a chapter at a time. I do use that technique. If I'm going to start a chapter, finish a chapter before you put it down, hopefully. A, a way to get at it. Uh, so definitely something I'm looking to improve. And also, kind of tied to the title of this book, Living Younger, uh, Younger Next Year, finding, seeing the value of maybe reading something that's outside of your profession. Like I, love, I like all the John Grisham books. It has zero to do with the military, but it also helps with the vocabulary and a few other things. But finding time for it, it is tough pellets. Yeah, I think uh, becoming a better writer involves reading good writers. But it's, I find that my writing always improves when I read something good that has nothing to do with my, mm -hmm. my vocation. So I'm reading a lot of sort of popular science, well-written stuff about <laughs> astrophysics. And yeah. it makes you think about the writing more because you're not so immersed in all your opinions built over decades about military affairs and things like that, I find. At this pay grade, under learning, working on strategic level communications, whether it's just a presentation uh, or writing skills, and that does weave into our Army profession as well because our seniors are part of it. No, no different than the lieutenant or the private. We're, we're part of that profession. So I, it's a necessary professional skill. Great. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the War on the Rocks podcast. Do not forget to check out our membership program, War on the Rocks Platinum, at warontherocks.com slash membership.